Could you turn the lights out? A lot of the housing in this area is named after people in the theatre trade. The street is Stukely Street, which is really historical. He was an amazing man. He uh, helped set up the British Museum. This spot used to be a nurse's home. Historically, it's a fascinating site. It's called Dudley House. It used to be the workhouse of central London. When you go down Drury Lane, you can sing Muffin Man. Uh, here comes the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man. Here comes the Muffin Man who lives in Drury Lane, oh. <laughs> and that used to be the arts club. And there were wonderful events took place there. So we've got Macklin Street, Betterton Street, more theatre names. This was the old Covent Garden Sainsbury's. This is where Sainsbury's first shop was. The print trade started about here, and that, this building down the bottom is the Odom's Press. These buildings used to be stables for horse, or horses that used to take the paper. Drury Lane, shooting down, as I say, the main north-south route. You've got to just get a glimpse of Bruce House, one of the lodging houses uh, George Orwell talked about. And before it, you've got Wild Street, which is quite apposite, because it's pretty wild sometimes. The building on our left, by the way, is um, Fieldings. It's the Magistrates Court, Bow Street, now a hotel. But it's famous for many, many cases. The press was always around here. This on the right we used to be the, the Opera House costume rooms. A lot of people there helped us with our banners and made things. This is a higgledy-piggledy medieval street pattern developed very arbitrarily. And suddenly, we're now looking across into the main entrance, hitting the square. Well, actually, it's a piazza. Thank you. Here we are, boy oh boy, in Covent Garden Piazza, in the main square of Covent Garden, and in the main square of London. Just one vast space. Very impressive. This is a film about the city, told through the story of one iconic London space, the Covent Garden Piazza. Each year, around 43 million people visit Covent Garden. They come for the shops and the theatres, for the street performers and the restaurants. But they also come because Covent Garden today is what it has been at various moments in its history. It's a place to come and feel part of London, even if you're only visiting. Because for almost 400 years, this has been a unique space. This piazza is like the frame of a painting, and inside it, generation after generation have lived out their lives. On these worn cobbles, we follow in the footsteps of fascinating characters. Celebrities and criminals, artists and pioneers, the filthy rich and the starving poor. All of these life stories are contained in the past of this one space. Although the piazza has changed a lot over the centuries, it still measures 316 feet wide by 420 long, as it always has done. And everything that has ever happened here has happened in this exact 
same space. If these stones could talk, what tales they would tell. There's a meaning there. It doesn't bear any comparison to when I was a young boy and it was all buzzing and, and, and going on. My name is Lou Myers. Uh, I was born in 1927. When I was about 10, I suppose, I had a friend whose family, the Baldwins, were established traders. I came down here on a Friday night with, with my pal. And uh, as a kid, I got a little casual job on a Friday night, stuck in boxes. It was very lucrative in those days. 10 shillings when I was a, when I was a, when I was a small boy, it was a lot of money. And basically, I suppose that's how I got involved or became part of Cover Garden Market. For much of the 20th century, Covent Garden is Britain's largest wholesale market, specialising in fruit, vegetables and flowers. It's a working-class community, living right in the centre of London and busy round the clock. Until... One night in the early 70s, the shutters come down for good and the piazza is earmarked for demolition and redevelopment. I was completely amazed that something like this was being promoted, the complete Philistine attitude of demolishing as much as they were. I introduced myself, Jim Bonahan. I'm an architect, um, getting a bit ancient in life. I got to know Covent Garden when I was about 17, 18. I was living around here off and on, sometimes squatting, because a lot of empty property. The planners came along and explained their scheme, and it was extraordinary. I came around with huge anger, actually, real anger and determination that we ought to do something. Because you're fighting the biggest boys in town. You're fighting a whole political system. You're fighting, most of all, money which speaks. No one talks about the sort of strength of Covent Garden. The major strength lies with the people who live and work here. The greatest asset one has is sort of personality, and one has them here. The fight against the developers is the final climactic battle fought by the community that emerged around the piazza. But the history of that community and this space is one that begins in the early 1600s, just after the age of Shakespeare and the Tudors. As it emerges from the medieval age, London expands towards a large private garden that once belonged to a nearby convent. It's now seen as a prime development opportunity by its new owner, Francis Russell, the Earl of Bedford. Francis Russell, the fourth Earl of Bedford, was a pioneer in terms of being a landowner and an aristocrat. He was a man who was looking uh, to turn his property into profit. During this period, you can see the seeds of capitalism emerging out of London. This is the, the early days of empire, also the idea of land, of private property being a thing that you can speculate on and with the design of Covent Garden. He came up with an idea that was totally foreign to anything that had been done in London before. Russell decided that he would create one single project, one single piazza. And there was this very strict form of the central piazza, this open space. This is very much the very first square that London had seen. An ordered, geometric, stone metropolis. On the southern edge of the empty piazza, a high wall protects the rest of the Earl of Bedford's estate. All along the eastern and northern sides is an impressive colonnade, four stories high. At the center of the western end is a church. 
the only building from the original piazza that survives. So it's a landmark from which we can find our way back to this lost world. This is the piazza soon after it was completed. So this is the late 1630s. And what it represents is a revolution in British urban living. Ah, it's so beautiful, isn't it? Gosh, the sort of sense of space is, 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 is extraordinary. I mean, you can just sort of feel what it would be like to walk across the piazza. You could sort of almost sort of hear the sounds, hear the city. Despite the fact that this building looks completely uniform, it's actually divided up into individual houses. So there's also a sort of sense in the design of the city needs to be a place of order. There is a very early description of this elegant space. A sermon preached in its own church so impresses the piazza's creator that Francis Russell notes it down for posterity. London, the ring. Covent Garden, the jewel of that ring. London's population is growing rapidly in the 1630s, but at a cost. Each year, the dirt and the disease and the overcrowded insanitary conditions claim the lives of thousands. And these uniform, porticoed houses with piped water looking out into the open space of the piazza, they are the new modern solution. And compared to much of the rest of the city, this place, this is a sanctuary. My old family has got a lot to be thankful for Covent Garden. But that there is my grandfather. Um, and he, he was the main man who we sort of followed into the market. That's, that's a, a good picture of him there. That's, that's how I remember him mostly. He was born in 1897. He was a very fair, kind, considerate man, but could throw a right-hander. So he spent a few times out on the stones, which was the cobblestones in Covent Garden Market, down by St Paul's Church. If there was a disagreement, they'd go out onto the stones, take their shirts off, and um, the last, last man standing was the winner, and they'd shake hands off and have a beer. But he was undefeated in all his time in Covent Garden. No one ever took him away. He, he was undefeated. So th th this is um, his son, Jim, Jimmy Mull. Um, that's my dad, Teddy Mull, all worked in Covent Garden Market, the same as I did. The whole family was connected through, for me, was connected through Covent Garden Market. If I ever wanted to find any family or anything like that, there's only one place I would go, and it would be Covent Garden Market, because that's where my family were, and that's part of me, that was part of, of what Covent Garden Market was. It was a place of, of work, it was a place of being connected, knowing people, advice, um, friendship. It meant so much to me personally, the buildings, the, the, the streets, everything about it was all part of my life, what was internally me. Although the Covent Garden market of recent history has a tight-knit working class population, this space begins in the 1600s as a sanctuary for those at the upper end of the social scale. So, at number 43 King Street is living William Paget, who is Baron Paget. At number two, the Great Piazza, is Sir John Harper. At number three is John Mordaunt, who is the first Earl of Peterborough. And going through this list of names, there were more earls and sirs and a lady. In fact, of the 22 residents of the piazza, 17 of them 
have titles. And this is not an accident. The leases for these houses stipulated they couldn't be divided up. They are for single residential use only. And what that means is that all but the very wealthiest are priced out. And that was always the intention. The only people who can afford to live in these houses are the wealthy elite. And Covent Garden, the piazza at its heart, is their exclusive space. But one outsider does break into this world of aristocrats and courtiers. He does so thanks to his rare talent. He is Richard Gibson. Richard Gibson uh, was an artist, uh, specifically a portrait miniaturist. He moves into Covent Garden probably a few years after he's married in 1641. And he's recorded as living on Long Acre off the piazza. Miniaturists were considered to be of gentlemanly status. And one of the really interesting things about the artists who lived in Covent Garden is that the nobility and even the, the royal family would visit them at home. These houses in Covent Garden were grand enough for people to travel to them. And it's very, very important, particularly for miniatures, that a studio is clean. So this lovely, clean, fashionable area is going to be very attractive to somebody like Gibson. So this is a uh, portrait miniature by Richard Gibson. He works in a very, very uh, specific way that's slightly different to other miniaturists working at the time. He is working in a more painterly style. You can see how brilliant Gibson was at painting uh, fabric, drapery. It's quite an experience going to an artist's studio, particularly a miniaturist studio. You'd have to have gone to his studio around six to eight times. And at this period, there's a real interest in watching people paint, which is why it was so important to live somewhere like Covent Garden, where your house was also interesting and pleasant and beautifully furnished, easy to get to. But of course, Richard Gibson, who describes himself as a dwarf, he signs his little portrait miniatures with the initials DG, which stand for Dwarf Gibson. Being a, a man of, of short stature, there's also a curiosity there with how this person who looks so different to everybody else is managing to, to produce these beautiful portrait miniatures. Richard Gibson is sitting for a friend here. He's, he's sitting for someone who knows him incredibly well. It's obviously a play on his height because you've got this comparative bust there but there's a sort of man who's made it look in his face. Interestingly, he changes his signature from DG to RG at the end of the 1660s. And I think this must uh, indicate a change in how he felt about himself. He's by now incredibly well established as an artist. He doesn't have to uh, present himself quite so much as dwarf first, artist second. So it's definitely a change in how he was starting to view himself and how he wanted others to view him. He seems to have crafted his life uh, rather beautifully. Richard Gibson's achievements is especially impressive because the Piazza's early years are among the most turbulent in English history. In 1642, tensions between the king and parliament lead to civil war. The civil war would have had a, a, a terrible impact, not just on Covent Garden, but the whole of the city. London, in some ways, ground to a halt. Business stopped, international trade trickled to almost nothing at all, and quite a lot of the quality, the aristocrats and the merchants, of the city would have left either to go to their country houses or to exile in Europe. And so you have this space which no longer really works as a residential space. 
So the Russell family have to find another way of generating um, sort of some kind of revenue. So you hear by about 1649 uh, that, that there was a marketplace. And this slowly, I think, became bigger and bigger. Quite a difficult childhood. My dad um, struggled coming back from the Second World War. He found it very difficult just to assimilate back into society. Um, so he had a, uh, quite a big drink problem. My parents split up and uh, my, my two brothers were more or less on the street, um, offending for themselves. I was a little bit younger. Um, I ended up on my own for a few days where my mum thought I was with my dad and my dad thought I was with my mum, but I wasn't and I was living on my own as a little boy. I was taken from there down to, to stay with my um, uncle down in Hampshire in Winchester. And then I could, they couldn't really contain me. And I was sent from there, different homes, and then I went into the Merchant Navy. So I, I spent uh, a few years traveling around the world and came back when I was 18. And that's when I went into the market. I'm a totally, absolutely totally uneducated person so I could barely read and write. I, I, I thank Covent Garden Market for my life. I, I've got to where I've got because of Covent Garden Market. They, it taught me. And anybody who survived it and you could do it, you'd go anywhere, anywhere. So uh, a lot to be thankful for. By 1660, the Civil War is over. And with the party-loving Charles II, the monarchy bounces back to the throne. For Covent Garden, it's both a restart and a new chapter. In 1661, Thomas Kilgrew, who is a courtier and a playwright, and who lives just over there at number eight, the Great Piazza, is given a permit by Charles II to build a new theater. And what he builds is the Theater Royal Drury Lane that you can see just over there, less than a minute's walk from the piazza. The first star to light up Drury Lane sets tongues wagging as she passes along this street. She is the original poor girl who hit the big time, Nell Gwynn. For a young girl like Nell, seeing the Theatre Royal Drury Lane open for the first time would have been a really exciting moment. Bearing in mind, if she was only 11 or 12, she'd have no memory of theatre existing beforehand. She worked in her mum's brothel at that point. In the records, it talks about her serving them drinks. And Nell uh, didn't waste any time getting a job as an orange seller at Drury Lane. And that's probably where she found her love of theatre and certainly where she started to get a vocabulary about what it meant to be on stage. Because by 1665, she was on stage herself. Bearing in mind this is a woman who had no education, who was illiterate, so she had to learn all of her part by people reading the part to her and her remembering it. It's a pretty huge act of memory. It's very impressive. She was so full of spark and humour, and I think it must have been an ability to improvise as well, to really think on her feet. One of the really appealing things about the theatre at that time was the amount of interaction that there was with the audience. And so there's a lot of interplay and a lot of asides where Nell would give a line to the audience because she seemed to have no fear. And in fact, rather than saying, I want to forget the fact that I was part of the brothel, she mentions the fact that she's a whore and she's not ashamed of it. One of the elements of the theatre at the time was that the actresses were pretty accessible to men and a lot of the reason why people came to the theatre at all was to watch the actresses. In fact, you could pay a penny to watch the women getting changed backstage at this time. This image of Nell Gwynn in some ways is quite unusual because she's got clothes on. But I think if you look closely in her face, you can see that there's a little bit of a raised eyebrow there, that what she's really saying is, if you come backstage with me, 
then, you know, who knows what will happen. By the time she met Charles II, she was on her way up, and the fact that Nell had a celebrity admirer and was, you know, in cahoots with the king would have been a massive up for her in terms of her status, in terms of the theatre, the bookings, the ticket sales. Theatre was a gathering point for the whole of society, and so you could go to the theatre and pay a penny and be guaranteed that you'd see the king there. Peeps actually referred to looking at the audience rather than looking at the stage. All the pleasure of the play was the king and my lady Castlemaine were there, and pretty witty Nell, which pleased me mightily. The fact that you could have gone to the theatre and watched Nell Gwynne on stage knowing that she was the king's mistress, and not only that, probably that the king was there too, to watch Nell and the King flirt in front of you must have been the best kind of reality TV of its time. She went on to become one of the greatest celebrities of her day uh, and would have been then the star of Covent Garden. we know as Dr John Ponteus is a skillful, charismatic, intelligent, possibly helpful person. <laughs> so John Ponteus sets himself up just off of the piazza at Covent Garden, treating the people that live around him. So he sets up his medical practice and his home there as part of a sales pitch. He publishes these medical books where he puts recipes for various treatments for various conditions. For the biting of a mad dog, take mint, a clove of garlic and salt. Stamp them together and lay to the bitten place and this will heal it. When it comes to our understanding of looking back at what medicine was like, we would probably see it as there being a very fine line between science and quackery. So there's an entry in a record of the St Paul's Church in Covent Garden of Margaret, daughter of John Ponteus, on the 12th of April, 1665, that she is buried. And beside the entry are three telltale letters, P-L-A. She has died of plague, and I think it's likely that she would be the first person in the Covent Garden Piazza area to contract and die of plague in 1665. But this is a normal burial. This is not your usual plague burial where family and friends are not supposed to be there. If I was to put money on it, and I'm not a betting woman, I'd potentially say that there was a fairly large-scale cover-up of this plague death. Why does Ponteus cover it up? Well, this is a time when somebody like Dr Ponteus can really rake in the money because they're aware that this is coming their way. They're going to be worried that perhaps plague might visit, that it, it might even be at the very mouth of the Thames. People are frightened and they're going to want treatments to see off the plague. If somebody had reported that Margaret had contracted plague and indeed had died of plague, her father and any members of that household are going to be locked up for 40 days plus. So if you can't work for that period of time, it probably isn't going to do particularly well when it comes to earning money. We think of him as being a money grubber, but it's entirely possible that he covered up the plague because he thought he had some cure for it. That is me being very kind. <laughs> Against the plague, take three ounces of the liquor of the inner rind of the ash tree with three ounces of white wine and give the patient every three hours. And within 24 hours, he shall be well by the grace of God. 
potentially around 15% of the population of London were lost during this bout of the plague, and that it may possibly have been over 100,000 people that died. After the plague, the piazza is never the same again. Fear of infection accelerates the flight of the aristocrats. And so the market improves its toehold in this space, receiving a royal license that is today memorialized in a colossal bronze plaque. What it tells us is that in May 1670, King Charles II issued a grant to the fourth Earl of Bedford to hold a market in Covent Garden Piazza on every day of the year except Sundays and Christmas days for the buying and selling of all manner of fruit, flowers, roots, and herbs. The middle of the night is the beginning of a new day for the night workers in the market. And there's only one 24 hours in the year when these streets are quiet from one midnight to the next. Everything that comes to the garden finishes its journey by hand and head and trolley into the shops. Every time I came here, my heart lifted as I walked here because you never know what was going to happen next. First the unloading and delivering, then the long job of sorting and setting out for sale roses and chrysanthemums in long wooden boxes. The scenes in that of the porter folding back the tissue paper on the um, boxes of chrysanthemums, that, yeah, I, I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of them. That stand he was on, standing up, standing them up 10, 15, I, I did that every night of the week. Half past four in the morning and everything's ready. Fruit and vegetables start selling at five. And by seven o'clock, buying is brisk. In the flower market, the salesmen are in, and so are the customers. If you went to the flower market, in what they call the silly season, where all the stuff comes from the silly aisles, the, the scents were just unbelievable. It's lovely. There's a joy to come to work. By 1670, the market is licensed and official, but it's still restricted to just a few shacks up against the wall on the southern side. The rest of the piazza remains as it had been intended, as an exclusive space. But then everything changes. The catalyst is that another acquisitive member of the Russell family now owns the piazza, the first Duke of Bedford. In 1705, he develops the southern side, building yet more houses. He also enlarges the market by moving it into the center of the piazza. This once empty space is now filled with the noise and the energy of commerce. 62 local residents send the Duke a petition complaining that tradespeople are invading their space. There is the stench and the filth of the market, and disturbances frequently happen by the great number of profligate and disorderly people who frequent the square. Just 70 years after it was created exclusively for the well-to-do, the piazza is now a contested space, and a colorful new era begins. This is very surreal. Oh my goodness. It's cool to kind of be put into this space and to see it all happening. And you can imagine kind of the, the hackney coaches moving past. I'm standing with where the market would be. Maybe street beggars on the, on the sides and ballad singers and things like that all kind of moving around you and the kind of the chaotic sounds of uh, kind of the hustle and bustle of so many people kind of flooding through. For a man who likes urban culture, 
Covent Garden in the early 18th century has it all. It has both high culture in the sense that the, the theatres are there uh, and it has um, the teeming popular culture of the market. For Joseph Addison, there wasn't another place like it. Joseph Addison is a wit, a bon viveur. He's the classic uh, urban writer and, and one of the people who sort of helps define that idea of the city as a place where writing and culture can thrive. So Addison set up a coffee house called Buttons in Russell Street, just off uh, the piazza. It's not somewhere you go for a quiet cup of If you go there in the evening or in the afternoon, you'll be sure to find um, some interesting writers who you can talk to, theatre directors, actors. They were probably over-caffeinated often. This is a noisy place, a noisy place full of conversation and talk, and that talk is serious in the sense that it's about things that matter. Politics, religion, gossip, um, sexual, sexual scandals, all the kind of things that go on in a modern urban political society. So that's a sort of an idea of public opinion was being formed in the coffee house. Buttons is just the start. In the early 1700s, the Three Chairs Tavern, the Bedford Coffee House, and the Shakespeare's Tavern all take over grand houses in the piazza. Covent Garden is acquiring a reputation for nightlife, one that will echo on for centuries. In this converted fruit warehouse in Covent Garden, for a 10-bob membership fee night after night, the patrons can do this sort of thing. In this cellar, you can hardly hear yourself speak, but no one seems to complain. Just there was a very, very famous club called Middle Earth, which you'd go in on a Friday and stagger out on a Monday. My name is Sharon Sickles, and I first came here well over 40 years ago as a, a young girl, and I was just hooked. It was just the most brilliant club. Mark Boland started there, jamming at the end of each night before he was famous. I am the god of hellfire, and I bring you fire. Arthur Brown, do you remember his song, Fire? Well, he had a flaming hat, but the whole thing went up, and we were all evacuated, you know, out onto the pavement. Brilliant nights. By the early 1700s, London is overtaking Paris to become the biggest city in Europe. The capital dominates the nation. It's home to one in 10 of the population. And some of the wealth and some of the opportunity that draws people here comes from London's position at the center of an expanding British empire. The trade with India, but also the Atlantic slave trade generate enormous profits, and much of that wealth remains concentrated in London. And some of it is spent here in the piazza. Among those getting their hands on the wealth that pours into 18th century Covent Garden is a complicated character called Moll King. Moll King is one of the most amazing entrepreneurs of 18th century London. She really comes with very little fortune into the world. She has to make her own way. But as a young woman, she gravitates towards Covent Garden. She puts together a little bit of cash herself, and then she does something really canny. She marries up. So she finds a young man who she calls Smooth Face Tom, and he's an old Etonian. And between them, they stump up enough cash to buy the small wooden building right outside the portico of St. Paul's Churchyard. And they start turning it into a coffee house. Just bare boards, some rudimentary trestle tables and furniture, something that's very rough and ready. What was different about Moles was that it was associated with drinking alcohol. And it was here also that the elites rubbed shoulders with the market traders. And interestingly enough, lower class women, what we would call sex workers, who went there to offer their services. 
Mole King is very careful not to allow any prostitution, any actual sex to take place on her premises. But Mole King and her husband Tom make a huge fortune. They buy a plot of land in Hampstead and are able to build their own country house villa. So we're talking more than just a few shillings here and there from running a coffee house. Where are they getting this money from? The answer is she is effectively the banker to the market traders and to the sex workers in Covent Garden. And she charges a higher rate to the sex workers than she does to the market traders. So they were people who owed her money, and as long as they stayed on the right side of her, there were no bad consequences. She's ruthless. She has a different set of morals and a different moral code than a woman of her status is expected to have. In this space, designed for the elites, for the aristocrats, you have this opportunistic culture of entrepreneurs and market traders, but also other kind of shadier types moving in as well. So Covent Garden in general started to take on the character of a red light district. If you look at morning from the four times of day, it's a cold winter's morning in the piazza in Covent Garden. Well, the first thing that strikes you right, right in the middle is this thin, grand-looking older lady marching across towards St Paul's Church there. She's clearly going to church early, seven o'clock in the morning. And behind her is her little page boy, shivering, holding her page, holding her prayer books under his arm. Um, but in front of the church where she's heading is Tom King's coffee house. And inside you can see people fighting, they're holding up staves. And in front, there are two couples embracing. Hogarth specifically cites mourning in Covent Garden because the piazza to Hogarth was the living heart of his world. Hogarth was a painter and has been called the grandfather of British satire. He was born into a poor family, but he wanted to improve his drawing. So he joined an academy run by Sir James Thornhill, which was in one corner of the great piazza. And five years later, he married, rather against Thornhill's approval, um, Thornhill's daughter, Jane. And they lived on the opposite side of the square, the southeastern corner. But also, there is something about the way that he draws the piazza or that life. There are great scenes in taverns, and they're very much Covent Garden people. He hated hypocrisy, and he felt very sympathetic to the poor and the outcast, the eccentric, the lonely. And so his stuff has got that rich life of the streets in it. But it's also the contrast between the meanness of the upper classes who actually were leaving the piazza at this date because they didn't want to be there with all this brouhaha, um, and the life of the streets, which is much more vivid and much more alive. The people are, are taking over. The whole of this area was a family. Everybody helped one another. We went to one another's funerals, we went to one another's weddings, we went to their parties. We, a whole language out there that we spoke that was different. We didn't have a lot, but what we had was the most we were ever going to get. So, yeah, it's life. I've traveled all over the world, literally. But there was always the feeling, no, I've got to bury my bones back here. I suppose you might as well call it coming home, really. At least one aristocrat still calls Covent Garden home, right up until the middle of the 18th century. He clings on inside the wedding cake grandeur 
of this house. Later, it will be the site of the nightclub Middle Earth. Today, it's an outlet for a makeup brand founded by a social media influencer. Lord Thomas Archer, who lives there at number 43 King Street, is the last of the aristocratic residents to leave the piazza. After he departs in 1757, there are none. With the last of the aristocrats gone, this space creates its own glamour. My name is Louise Hurd, and my relation to Covent Garden Piazza is that I have been working this shop since about 1988. In, in fact, actually a bit before that, when I was a teenager and uh, lived in South East London and um, was just desperate to get up to this place called Covent Garden. And to come up here was just really exciting for me. It was just very bustling. There was a lot going on outside. There were fashion shops, there were lots of vintage clothes shops. All the old pubs were still here, but there were also lots of cafes. And also, like, in front of the church, that was, uh, that was the first place you would have seen, like, street dancing to hip-hop. I mean, it was that exciting. Everything was kind of coming together in this area. There's some kind of energy here, and we're right in the middle of the market, in Covent Garden. And I think that there's some kind of theatrical ley lines that sort of converge in Covent Garden Piazza. By the middle of the 1700s, there is now a second theatre in the area, the Theatre Royal Covent Garden. We know it today as the Royal Opera House, and it has an entrance leading directly out to the piazza. This colonnade now becomes a boulevard of dreams, and one of the first to pass along it is a starstruck wannabe called Charles Macklin. Macklin is a prickly character, there's no doubt about it. He's born Cahill McLaughlin in the northwest of Ireland. Like many Irish before him and after him, Macklin came to London to, uh, to, to, for, his, for, for fame, for fortune. Before he was famous, it's fair to say that he was infamous. He comes to big public attention in 1735 when an unfortunate backstage incident with a fellow actor leads to a violent event. They're squabbling over a wig. Macklin insisted this was crucial to his part. And he ends up stabbing him in the eye with a stick. Macklin stands trial for murder, and he represents himself. He cross-examines witnesses. He's very capable. He's very authoritative. He's very assertive. Obviously, his acting background helps him. He gets let off with manslaughter, and he's back acting very quickly as well. So when he plays uh, The Merchant of Venice, when he plays Shylock in that play, is this snarling, dangerous, vicious villain. He terrifies audiences. He's said to have given George II a sleepless night after the king went to see it. This makes his name. He becomes a superstar in the London theatrical world. It's difficult for many uh, to be Irish in London at this time. There are concerns about uh, Irish, uh, cheap Irish labour coming over. There are prejudices against the Irish. So Macklin's journey from being born in an extraordinary rural part of Ireland to become one of the most celebrated actors of the age is remarkable. And when London Irish people saw him act night after night, in them they saw opportunity. This is a wonderful story that tells us quite a lot about, you know, Macklin's ambitions, but also the, the Covent Garden, the area that's a very uh, febrile place, a very energetic place, uh, a place that crackles with energy and possibility. Looking down into the piazza today, we can imagine the carnival that overwhelmed it in the 18th century. Because in 1747, one artist paints the view from this spot. Samuel Scott captures the people of this space in intricate and fascinating detail. 
Mall King's Coffee House is in front of the church. In a hay cart, a mother feeds her baby. There are people from the further reaches of the empire. A brawl breaks out, watched by two women leaning out of a window. Their house on the north side is a brothel run by the famous Jane Douglas. Jane Douglas was born in 1698 in Edinburgh with a father, John Douglas, who was a black man by complexion, and a mother, Susanna. They weren't married, and um, they encouraged her to kind of indulge in sex work because her father was uh, owned a public house. After her father died and her mother was arrested for pickpocketing and transported, Jane herself was then cast out of the city because of her reputation, because of the way um, that she was very open and bold with men. She then moves into Covent Garden, uh, the piazza in about 1735, um, and there she becomes well known. She has a quite outgoing personality. She was very good at drinking, she had quite coarse language. In the space of Covent Garden, this culture of debauchery and leisure, being bold and being of character made you popular. In other spaces, it was more appropriate to be dainty, more appropriate to be modest. It was the complete opposite in this space, and that worked. She was a victim of circumstances in many ways. But in a lot of ways, she also adapted to the kind of business mind and the commercial mind and she was well known for procuring young women into her home. And that's because that was the preference of the industry. And she notably would cast out women if they got too old or if they started to lose their beauty. Her brothel began to thrive. She decorated it with lavish furnishings and fabrics, and notably even had a restaurant in there with waiters in order to allow their clients to feel like they've entered into a civilized place. So her clientele tended to range from even the highest echelons of society, particularly of the aristocracy. Jane Douglas, she achieved comparably upper middle class status and that would may not have occurred in any other space. And there were obviously a lot of victims who did not have the same story, who were abused and suffered because of this industry. And I think that just shows the variety and the, um, the choices that a lot of women were kind of forced into to survive. In 18th century London, one in five women earns some of their income from selling sex. In the piazza, the proportion is almost certainly higher. The life stories of most of these women are lost to history. But documentary evidence of this world does exist, and it still has the power to shock. Here, in these registers of christenings, on the 22nd of November, 1752, is a baby girl named Priscilla Passage. And instead of the names of her parents, she is described as a dropped child, which is just an absolutely heartbreaking term. This child has been abandoned, and she's been abandoned, and she's been found in the Covent Garden Piazza. She's been given this name Passage after the place where she was found. Now, abandoned, unwanted children, that is by no means unusual for the London of the 1700s. But what makes this problem more acute here in Covent Garden is the area's place as one of the centers of London's sex trade. A few months later, here's a baby boy called Kendrick King, again, a dropped child. He's been named after King Street to the northwest of the Piazza. And April 1753 is a baby girl who's been christened Henrietta Street. Well, Henrietta Street is the line of big houses to the south of the Piazza. The christening of a baby implies that the state or the authorities have stepped in and picked up the pieces for these abandoned children. But 
Books like this, which is a register of burials for the same church, St. Paul, Covent Garden, I'm afraid they tell a much darker story. There is a register of the burial of the dropped child Priscilla Passage. This burial takes place 28 days after her christening. And if we go forward a few pages, here is a record of the burial of the little girl who'd been named Henrietta Street. This is just 20 days after her christening. And the little boy who'd been named after King Street, Kendrick King, is also buried in this church. Now, he at least got to see his first birthday. He's a little over 14 months at the time of his burial, but not one of these three children born and abandoned in Covent Garden in this short period in the middle of the 18th century, not one of them lived to see their second birthday. These unwanted children are the other side of Covent Garden's famous notoriety. The tide of history begins to turn against the excesses of the piazza. By the late 1700s, people are actively addressing society's problems. And there is a new approach to law and order, pioneered right here by one John Fielding. John Fielding was a magistrate and he was dispensing law and order on Bow Street in Covent Garden. Bow Street sort of backs on to the northeasterly corner of the piazza. At this time, a magistrate is part judge, part police officer, which on the one hand, it seems like if you're going to do that job, this is probably <laughs> the best place to do it because you are surrounded by all kinds of criminal activity at this stage. But also, he's kind of a hard job to do. The act of exchanging money for sex is not illegal, but there are activities around it which are. So even in just one pub, for example, you could have pickpocketing, you could have counterfeiting, you could have licensing fraud, you could have soliciting. And the way that the, the justice system works, it's known categorically that it's corrupt. The accused themselves, if they were a person of means, could, you know, bri bribe the magistrate. And, and that was just known that, that that's how it worked. But John Fielding really seems to have been trying to make a change, trying to build up a team around him to be the group that, that don't take the bribes, that don't um, succumb to any form of corruption. We would call them the Bow Street Runners now. At the time, typically, they were known as Fielding's people. The image of John Fielding says to me a man who's very comfortable with who he is. He has a calmness within him. And of course, I'm drawn to a headband which sits just above his eyes, which indicates that he is blind. Whilst other people see it as, as sort of a tragedy, he he sort of takes it in his stride. It really is fascinating that it doesn't in any way seem to have held him back whatsoever. In a very short period of time, he had a lot of success. And he's years ahead of the game, really, in terms of what he's doing to try and clean up the streets. If you look at what he was doing, you can see that that's being replicated 100 years later, 200 years later, right up until to what is happening today. And if we take that back to the formation of the Metropolitan Police itself in 1829, a lot of the systems that they use were implemented by John Fielding. So 
So my path was somewhat broken because I'd still got the wanderlust from traveling around the world. But anyway, I left, I came back again and I wanted to get back into the market. So I went back to my family. My uncle George said to me, we'll get you back in the market as a beetle. A beetle is, um, is a market officer and their job was to police the, the actual market itself. Overseeing what was going on, overseeing who was doing what and who was going where and who shouldn't be where and what's that lot going down there and that shouldn't be there because that was owned by that company there. This is where you was allowed to bring your produce out and the produce would go back up like that and if the beetle came down and saw you pass there, he'd say, bang the box, kick the box, get it back over the line. Because you, this, if you look, that's all you had to walk in. And the barrow had to come down here and pick stuff up. So it was very, very tight. You could not come over the line. The beetles wouldn't allow you to. And this place was buzzing at, at 12 o'clock at night when the rest of London was going to sleep. And then you can imagine what, what sort of, that drew everyone in because the rest of London was shut down, this wasn't. So it, there was lots and lots of people here. That's why as a beetle, you had to keep, keep on your toes. Come on, hold it! Every now and then, the authorities try to impose order on the chaos of the market. In the early 1830s, as the young Princess Victoria awaits her coronation, the Bedford family get rid of the clutter of the sheds and the shacks. From now on, the trade in fruit, veg, and flowers will happen inside a single, immense market building, two centuries after the piazza was conceived of as an empty space. A new era begins. The market is now the dominant presence. We're now in an age of economic growth, but also growing demands for better social order. And this new market, with its rules and its regulations, is all about increasing profits, but also tightening control. So the bustling, sometimes chaotic, fruit and vegetable market is now to be contained within these elegant arcades and walkways. The market, well, it has been my life. You know, basically the whole of my working life. It's just home. There's hundreds of people working here and you know them all. I used to make my own things. It was handmade crafts. I loved the fact that I was working for myself, but now I work for my friend because I'm sort of semi-retired. There you go. Once a shopkeeper, always a shopkeeper. There's never a day where I don't want to come into work. It's the uniqueness of the market. It's essentially London, and someone will always know something that you don't. A stroll through the market building is one of the big draws of Covent Garden as Victorian London window shops amid the exotic fruit and aromatic flowers the piazza claws back some respectability and this is still theatre land along the colonnade to the Royal Opera House comes an actor who wants to change the world Ira Aldridge Ira Aldridge was a black American actor who was born in New York in 1807, but there was no avenue for him to have a career in New York. Slavery was still full-blown. You know, New York was a free state, but being an actor of color was not a known path. Slavery was not enforced on British soil. It was in the plantations and in colonial um, countries, but not, not on British soil. So he came to Britain to, to try. He spent seven, eight years touring about 50 theatres around the country, getting experience, getting work, getting paid. Um, and he got a good reputation. The reviews were good. 
So in 1833, Edmund Keane, who was the greatest actor of his generation, he collapsed on stage at the Theatre Royal Covent Garden when he was playing Othello. And the manager of the theatre asked Ira Aldridge to come in and take over. People, seeing someone like Ira Aldridge on stage in a leading title role at one of the, the legitimate theatres in London, would have been a huge deal. I mean, if he got this right, his career would be made. And also, it was completely a political act. And I think he was very aware of it, because at the time that he was at Covent Garden, the vote to abolish slavery in all British colonies was about to go through Parliament. And Ira Aldridge disproved the argument that slavery was for the good of the Negro. You know, these are people who need guidance. They wouldn't be able to manage on their own. He performed well. The audience enjoyed it. And in the press the next day, the reviews, awful. Mr. Aldridge has nothing to recommend him for the part of Othello but his complexion. Some of them are just downright racist. His foot is ugly and he walks upon it with the heavy, unelastic tread of a dromedy. In my opinion, uh, the reviews were a tactical move to demerit him because the newspaper owners are powerful people who benefit financially somewhere from slavery. The vulgarisms of his pronunciation is quite unheard of in good society. So he played for two nights at Covent Garden and then the theatre closed. He never, ever played Covent Garden again in his lifetime. But three months after Ira was at the Theatre Royal, the abolition of slavery in British colonies was passed. When I see this face, I always think he's smiling a little bit inside. But it also has the weight of experience. He knows more than I think we can ever know. He's had to battle so many things to do what he did. Um, it's a good face. The sheer velocity of London's growth in the 19th century is just astonishing. By the 1860s, the population was around 3 million. That is three times what it had been just 60 years earlier at the start of the century. London is a global center of trade and finance and the heart of a vast empire. To satisfy the city's enormous demand for fruit, vegetables and flowers, the market bursts out of its new building. The market that began as just a few little sheds on the southern side of the piazza before being moved into the center has now taken over the perimeter. There is little left in the piazza now other than markets. It became a victim of its own success within a few decades. There's reports in Punch magazine about the streets being basically full of vegetable detritus and being slimy and horrible as a result. It was called the Mud Salad Market by Punch magazine. This would be very, very tight here. You could hardly move. There would be polters, there would be trolleys, there would be barrows. This place would be very, very, very busy. When I first came here, it was very, very intimidating. Very intimidating. Um, a lot of hard men, a lot of busy men. They didn't, have, they didn't suffer falls gladly. So you had to be on your game. There would be arguments and rows because there'd be lorries parked up that shouldn't be parked up. Stuff would get jammed. If someone left anything laying about, it disappeared rapidly. So it was, everything was moving. It was like its own world, its own place, if you like. As early as the 1880s, there are calls for the market to be moved out of the piazza. 
But a sense of tradition and the lack of any obvious alternative site means that nothing happens for almost a century. This book is published in 1968, and it lays out a plan for the closure of the fruit and vegetable market and the flower market. Now, Covent Garden, by this point, is no longer owned by the Bedford family, but by a consortium of three local authorities. And they've joined forces to make the piazza, as they would have seen it, fit for the late 20th century. After three centuries on its present site, the Covent Garden Market is expected to vacate the 15 acres it now occupies in the heart of London. By the early 1970s, the brave new London of the planners is starting to take shape. Finally, after more than 300 years, the market is to leave Covent Garden. Two miles to the south, in an old railway yard just across the Thames, a new market building is being created. It is vast, purpose-built, and has little in the way of character. It's the end of an era, as far as I am concerned. It is like someone said to me after you lived in an house for 31 years that you have got to go to somewhere else. And that, to me, honestly, there's no two ways about it. It just don't seem right to me. I'm sorry. What are you going to feel about working there after working here? Well, the conditions can't be any worse than they are here, can they? Have you seen them over there? Yeah. It'll be very much easier to do your business, and perhaps the, the hours will be shorter and so on, but there'll be something lacking, obviously. To the urban planners of the 1970s, the Covent Garden market is a relic. And like horse-drawn carts, or the Piazza's flower girls, it has no place in their vision of the future. Late in the day, when prices have fallen, the old ladies come round who sell their flowers in the London streets. But things aren't what they were. When Jenny started selling flowers on street corners, Victoria was queen and every gentleman wore a buttonhole. But that was a long time ago. The flower girls were just two of the hundreds of people that Henry Mayhew interviewed for his pioneering work, London Labour and the London Poor. He met them in Covent Garden at the Piazza. And this is the first time when ordinary working people have been allowed to tell their stories in their own words. So there are two girls. Uh, one is 15, one is 11. They're sisters. We don't know their names. We know that they had very thin dresses, cracked bonnets. One of the girls, the younger one, she didn't have any shoes, so she trotted along barefoot next to her sister, the 15-year-old sister. We live on bread and tea, sometimes a fresh herring of a night. Sometimes we don't eat a bit all day when we're out. What I get from their testimony is the sheer ordinariness of their struggle. They simply take it for granted. There is no escape. They are trapped in this cycle of working 12-hour days for pennies. They are only ever a few shillings away from starvation. I've never had a sixpence given to me in my life. Never. I never go among boys. We can all read. When the older girl says that she doesn't know boys, what that means is that she's not dabbling in prostitution. And for them, literacy is something which would allow them to advance themselves later on, maybe become stall holders. Uh, they might have some kind of small holding. They might be able to improve their life chances. Ultimately, the flower sellers were part of a slow, painful, social process that eventually would lead to the foundation of the welfare state, ultimately preventing people like that from ever having to go through the struggles that they went through. In the more short term, what happened to them? It might be that their famous chastity was tested and they became prostitutes. Perhaps they died of starvation 
of disease, uh, of the cold. Uh, perhaps they struggled on. We simply don't know. The plight of the flower girls draws other writers to Covent Garden. Among them is a man whose books will capture all the wonder and all the misery of London in the middle decades of the 19th century. Charles Dickens. When Dickens was about 12, his father was arrested for debt. His mother moved into the prison with his father and with their younger children. But the young Charles was left in lodgings on his own. And every morning, Dickens would walk into London and go to work. And the route from his lodgings would have taken him through Covent Garden. And so Covent Garden Market was a place where he knew what it was to be hungry, to be cold, to be poor. But as well as that, in Dickens's middle years, he ran two um, magazines, first Household Words and then All the Year Round. First of all, their offices were in Covent Garden. So it was a place he more or less lived. And he used the market for copy. He writes about going to the market and stopping at one of the church porches, where, as he says, a bunch of unidentifiable lumps are sleeping, which turn out to be children. One of the worst night sights to be found in London is the children who prowl about this place. They sleep in the baskets. They fight for the offal. They dart at any object they think that they can lay their hands on and are perpetually making a blunt pattering on the pavement of the piazza with the rain of their naked feet. His true empathy for what he calls these houseless children is so strong, I think, because of his own childhood. When I had money enough, I used to go to a coffee shop and have half a pint of coffee and a slice of bread and butter. When I had no money, I took a turn in Covent Garden Market and stared at the pineapples. I think in the end, the piazza to Charles Dickens was a place of possibility. Whether the possibility was good or bad, I don't even think he knew. But as well as that, one of the things that we forget about cities is that they're not of a certain period, that we live in cities that are constantly evolving. And Dickens was particularly aware of this and how it's never just today, it's always yesterday as well, was something that he was very profoundly aware of. A century after the death of Charles Dickens, the space he knew so well is no longer slowly evolving. It faces drastic change. Because moving the market is just the beginning of the planner's ambitions in the late 20th century. This plan states that Covent Garden Piazzas, the first of London squares, is now in the late 20th century obsolete. And then it goes on to use the key buzz phrase of post-war planning, comprehensive redevelopment. There's to be new offices, a new conference center, some new housing, and lots of new widened roads, some of them running underground. There are aspects of Covent Garden that are to survive. The church and the market building itself are to remain, but other than that, this is Covent Garden erased. And this is the obliteration of a part of London that is and always was special, a part of London that the three centuries had operated and existed in certain ways, that had played a certain function in the history, it had adapted and changed over the years. But this isn't change. This is revolution. This is 
brutalism, not just in architectural style, but in an attitude to what cities are and what they mean to people. 350 years after it was created as London's most dramatic open space, the final nail is about to be banged into the coffin of the piazza. My name's Jim Monaghan, and we're sort of here quite early in the morning. Covent Garden Market, there's people in the area, the residents and the workers sort of got together, and a sort of community group was sprung up, sort of very emotional public meetings were held. The main task to begin with was to let people know in the area what was proposed. And one of the most effective ways was that was a poster that was done just slapping on buildings saying the GRC is going to demolish this building and filling in the date. Because people just didn't know, you know. And suddenly overnight, people actually visually in the streets say, well, what on earth is this? What do you mean pulling this building down or whatever? And suddenly there was a, a realization that something was up and suddenly the campaign really started. I think youth sort of says, do it. You didn't think about whether you were going to succeed or not. What I'm trying to say is to keep us all together. You break up a community which is happy, yeah. which is happy, and you're never going to anywhere else in London. When this plan is carried through, there will be actually more flats and more people living here than there is at the present. But not us. But there'll be such rents that people can't afford. What are you going to do? What can we do? Marches and standing outside of town halls. This is what we've got to do. We've got to let them know we're here. Should we drink for that? We're not bloody going. Out the bellies and the back, every hole and every crack. The market closes forever on the 8th of November, 1974. Mickey Mole witnesses the death of a 300-year-old tradition. It was heartbreaking to see the, um, the rubbish and the junk all thrown everywhere and the, the soul of the market had been just ripped out and thrown across the floor. That's what it looked like to me anyway. Because I was the beadle, they left really, on that night time, just me here with the keys. It was cold, it was, um, a slight breeze was blowing up, uh, stuff was flapping about in the wind. Doors were banging. It was quite eerie. It affected me. I don't know, I've, I've often thought about this over the years. Why did it affect me so much? After all, it's only a job. But it wasn't, not for me, because all my family worked here. My grandfather, my dad, uncles, cousins, relatives worked here for years and years and years and years, and it was as if it was part of my soul, part of me. And they'd just taken that away and destroyed it. Although the market traders are gone, the future of this unique space is secure. The campaigners fighting to save the piazza convinced the government to give around 250 local buildings preservation orders, what's known as listing. When that decision was made in 74 to list 250 buildings, that basically killed the plan, bang. So that was when the official plans for this area were dead. So for a time, it was brilliant. It was a vacant site and there was this interregnum about what's going to happen. There was an absolutely amazing flowering of, of community action and different activities taking place. Festivals were held, the gardens were built. Uh, this is a programme for community festival. Well, we elected our king and queen and we marched around the area. We had a fantastic weekend. 
performers, competitions, theatre, our own beer tent, very successful. And then we set up a housing co-op and began doing our own housing, some of which would survive. It was really exhilarating, really remarkable. And all of that's gone. You know, in retrospect, the big mis mistake we ever had we made was we never got into actually getting an ownership of the land. The property market doesn't hang about. In the 1980s, the piazza is sold to a private landlord. Under their ownership, this space has filled with cafes, restaurants, and big brand shops. A lot has changed, but the piazza as it is today would still be easily recognizable to the people who lived and who worked here in the 18th or the 19th centuries. And that sense of continuity means that Covent Garden is one of those places where it feels like history is close to the surface. It's one of those places where, if we're open to the idea, it is almost possible to sense the presence of the earlier generations, the people with whom we, in a way, share this space. Purpose, and at the weekends when this place is absolutely, as we say, ramo, and it's, it's got lots of energy, so it hasn't died. It's just morphed into something different, and I'm glad it has because it's still got a life. It's alive. This film is part of a bigger national project that uses immersive technologies to allow you to see the UK differently. You can explore other famous shared spaces and their histories by downloading a free app. To find out more, go to bbc.co.uk slash Covent Garden. How did we cope without it? The secret genius behind everyday tech in our modern lives? Press red to watch on iPlayer. Also new on BBC Sounds, everything you need to know about the economy and what it means for you in a new podcast. Music